So how you doing, buddy? Good, you? Chilling, man. Chilling. Doing no great, work. actually. I'm on like five hours of sleep, but you know, ran, worked out, ate good, drank good. No, we tried to test today, didn't you? Yeah. How was that? It was nice. Some people didn't want to do it, but I, I felt like. Why, like I was telling you earlier, why can't you just do it? Why are you going to, oh, you have to get ready and then practice, like, just try to always stay in shape, but you have to always stretch. That's mm-hmm. why my back was hurting, because they were telling me at work, like, oh, you're pretty stiff. I stretch a lot, but, like, stiff. Like, when they're doing this, when they're trying to bend my mm-hmm. wrists, my wrist can't go far yeah, at all. You you're either like going to break it or mm-hmm. I'll tap out, because my yeah. wrist is so, like, you know? Yeah, you can't get that. It's not flexible. Yeah, That's, yours is already more yeah. flexible than mine. But it hurts. Like, the moment you, you get to that <sighs> that point, you can snap it. So, when I was in karate, mm. and when yeah. I was learning Krav Maga, that was one of the moves they taught us. Like, in Krav Maga, they would make you grab the wrist, and, you know, just by pushing it in the right place, it's it hurts. <sighs> Even the biggest guy will I think will because mine, I have so less retention on it my defense is like way more i don't give you no time to get that far mm. it's like a not a fear but like mm. i'm either gonna tap out or just defend it from happening i mean yeah you don't want to have to break your wrist too like much. adesanya like i guess he's scared to go to the ground because that's his like i say it's his weakness but he's not a ground yeah, he's not he's, he doesn't have the ground game like some of them even he's not a wrestler though so he's, he's a kickboxer he's a he, yeah exactly he's a striker so it's like yeah, these people then come from the grappling background. So, yeah, kind of like what happened with um, uh, McGregor, like when he faced Khabib. Like he didn't have any ground game. Like he no. was not even wasn't even a, a, a fair match, honestly. Like Khabib just killed it. But dude, wanted to talk to you about about the original Jack. Mm-hmm. You know where we came from, where you came from. Talk about elementary school. Talk about Haiti. Talk about growing up. Talk about where we are today. You know? So let's go back to when we first met. Second, Second grade. grade. Kiskeo Christian School, Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Mm. Sometime in the 90s. I can't even yes. really tell you what, what year. What was it? 94 maybe? What? I was born Probably in 97. Probably 95. Probably oh. 95. Or 96. 95, 96. It had to be earlier. Yeah. It's yeah. not 94. Yeah, it had to be at least 94, 95. Because I have the yearbook from back then. Like, I still have that yearbook. Uh, it has to be one of them. I remember my yearbook, 94, 95, and that was at Northwest Christian Academy. Mm-hmm. That was in Miami still. Mm, okay. So, it wasn't 94. My mom died in 94. So. Okay, so you definitely came after. After that. Okay, so you were born here in the U.S., right? Miami, Florida. All right. And then uh, your mom passed, so your dad decided to move back to Haiti? Yep. Easier for him. You know, over here it's all about work and bills, so mm-hmm. it's easier to support a family or a child there. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. So and you learned the English here, obviously, before you went over there. Like I mean, I was born here. So What about Creole? You got Creole, that when you went I learned it from my maids and my grandmother. Mm-hmm. When, you went, when you went back to Haiti, yeah. right? Bro. My dad fired one of the maids because she called me a makut. And I told her, Papi, what's a makut? And he's like, who called you that? I'm like, damn. <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> like, <laughs> Yo, for those who don't know, a makut was, um, I guess it, it was a, the special officer of Givalier. of Givalier. Like, they had a, his own little private army, and that's what they were called. They were, like, almost like mercenaries. So that's what a makut was. They weren't very nice people. Um, a lot of them were ex-military, ex-like officers, like really high up. To be precise, like Tonton Makut is what they call them. Yeah, like a, his yes. paramilitary guys. Exactly. Yeah. So we so back to Kiskeo Christian School. So we meet in the second grade, and um, mm. you had to, you know, move back uh, from the states. You lost you lost your mom, was was probably really tough. But when you first got to Haiti, how did you feel? It? How did you feel when? You went to school the first time and meeting everybody that was there because I was there already before you got there. So I already knew everybody in the grade before you were in there because I've been yeah. there since pre-kindergarten. So 
I've been there since I, I was four years old, and you came like a few years after. So mm -hmm. how how was that when you were coming in, like into a whole new country with people you didn't know, a language you barely spoke? Well, I lived in Haiti before that. Actually, I lived in Haiti as a baby before for like a couple of months, and then I came back. But I don't remember that, of course. But after that, when I got there, I mean, the first day I got to, I didn't remember because it was dark. That's what I remember. It was dark, and I went to my cousin's house, but. Um, when I went to school, I tested several schools with my dad, took me to some places, NAS, I think, Morningstar, but I ended up going to Kiskea, but it was really community-oriented, you mm -hmm. know, first day it was chapel, and I saw, you know, the St. Lowe's there, you know, shout out to them, I have great friends, mm -hmm. but it was cool. It was an English school, English-speaking school, private school, so it's not like I was learning going through the French system or anything so All right it was cool um what was your first memory um of going to school do you remember your first day like uh, um yeah I met Mark Anthony one of my great friends our yeah, great shout friends out to, shout out to Mark <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know we'll have him on here one day it was on recess we met at recess and then we met on the slide he said hey you want to be friends like yo yep. now we're still friends till now like <laughs> is that funny you know I mean dude back then how much were we in a class like like 20, 20, people. you think it was 20, that 21, much? Yeah. I always felt like it was almost like evenly divided between girls and guys. Like there was like eight girls, eight guys, nine oh. girls, nine guys, something Ratio's like that. Ratio was kind of almost even. Yeah, it was kind of like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we we go to school. We we grew up in in the system, Christian system in in Haiti. Uh, we didn't ex we didn't experience. I didn't experience any any outside of. Outside of Kiskeo Christian School, I didn't experience the French system. I don't know if you uh, know if you ever went into one of those systems. I, no. I never got got to do that stuff. And we were pretty sheltered. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, like school, after school, get picked up, or you know, just playing. We either go to parties. I wouldn't go to like any events there or anything. Yeah, outside I mean, of the school. Yeah. The, I mean, the school would host like Christmas bazaar and stuff like that, and you know, place for teachers and and parents and students to, you know, like an extracurricular activity outside of school hours. Those were always fun. You know, you got to see your friends outside of school. But like you said, you know, we're pretty sheltered over there. Um, the country wasn't always like in the best state, even when we were growing up. There were a lot of times um, we would miss school because of manifestation and stuff like that. Like, I remember um, one of the first times I saw um, a decapitated head was on my way to school one day, one morning. It was like oh, yeah. 7 a.m. and we were driving down Delma and there was a body and the head was like 10 feet away from me. Hell him. yeah. Heading to school, you see a guy. I still remember this one, like right down from my street because I lived in Delma. Delma 31, sorry. And Delma 31st. Let me just translate that real quick for. But um, yeah, he was tied up. He was a thief tied up with barbed wire to his feet in the back of a pickup and you know this regular school day morning you see that so it's like kind of get desensitive to certain things yeah it's almost like it's almost like you're used to it you know it's 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 crazy how when you experience something when you're a lot younger and then you try to see it later or think about it later in life and you're just like damn this thing had no effect on me when i was growing up it was almost like it was part of everyday life it's, yeah it's pretty crazy how you can just get used to seeing something like that you know it's it's you'll never forget it but yet it's not like you it was like that traumatizing where it's like it was just like every day you know and as we got older um you know things got worse and eventually we had to leave. Like in 2004, we didn't, I didn't graduate from Kiskeo Christian School. Um, I don't think you did either. I we left after 10th grade. Yeah, same thing here. We did junior here, junior, junior and um, senior year here in um, the United States. And uh, yeah, I mean, things in Haiti were pretty tough in 2004. It forced a lot of kids to have to leave and and those that couldn't leave, like some of our best friends had to stay because they're Haitian and they have Haitian passports, so they couldn't leave. And you know, when there are all the kidnappings and the exile of Aristide happened in 2004, those that could have left, left and you know, um, finished school elsewhere. But uh, you, you ended up coming to Miami, back yeah. to Miami. 
came back, um, moved with moved to my sister's house. My dad stayed there, and you know started. I went back to the same school I was at in kindergarten, pre-K, Northwest Christian Academy. So went back there, saw people I still knew from there, like certain classmates, administration. So it was kind of like a... Like 11 years later, almost? Yeah, just came back, and it was pretty cool that some people remembered me. Mm -hmm. um, stayed there for a year. It was pretty cool. Played basketball there for the school. Um, and then after that, when it was like, damn... Like my dad's paying for a private school and all that. He's in Haiti, so I'm like, yo, let me just go to a, a public, school. public school, you know, save money. Went to a public school, graduated at MacArthur, um, MacArthur High School in Hollywood, Florida. Cool experience, um, not bad at all. Ran track there. What you do for college? You, you, didn't, you, you stayed here in Florida too, right? Yeah. I went to straight to Nova. Um, School's so expensive. <laughs> I went to Nova, did criminal justice straight there. My sister went to Nova. So I was like, got accepted at FIU, Nova, um, Barry, but I decided to go to, go to Nova. And I started thinking of bio. I took one class in bio, and I was like, nah. And I just, you know, stopped, stopped doing that. Went to criminal justice and went there for almost three years, and I didn't graduate from there. I ended up taking like a a nice five five year and change break and decided to go back, went to FAU and got my bachelor's there. But throughout that time I I've worked every single job you could think of. I worked in the medical field, juveniles, um gas station, I was a tutor, a reading tutor. Um, I, I was really doing so much things and then I decided to, hey, I started something, let me finish it and then close that chapter. And then after that, I moved, moved to DC. Mm -hmm. But before we get to DC, let me, let, let's go back to the, the schooling systems and the differences between um, the school system in Haiti versus what was in the US because it was a big drastic change for me at least. Oh, yeah. Like it was, it was a, a big culture shock for me when I first moved here because like like we said before like our classes were very small the whole school mm -hmm. maybe not had more than like 200 300 kids and you come here and the public school has thousands of students and yeah. it, it's, it was very overwhelming the first year I was here for sure I never had to take a bus in my life you know I don't know about you like mm. I, all the public transportation stuff we never did growing up so coming here for the first time was a real culture shock for me oh, yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, even fitting in and finding the right, right people to talk to and making friends was, I found it to be very difficult. I found myself <clears throat> leaning more towards like people from the islands. So I would try to find Haitians and mm -hmm. people I can like, you know, have some kind of common ground with. And uh, there, there were very few, but those few became friends, you know. Um, some of them I still talk to today. Yeah. Um, but I was curious, how was it for you? We, we did go to different high schools here. You were in uh, all the way in East Miramar, and I was west and in a more up, I guess you can say, up West End. Yeah, West End, which is predominantly, like, white neighborhood, and they're wealthy up there, so. Yeah, your mom thought I was in the hood. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't many um, African-American families living in the neighborhood when I first got there, but after a few years, they started getting more. But in the beginning, it was very, very rare to see them. But how was it for you um, when you first got back and then you had to transition back into the U.S. system? It was a culture shock for me, too. Um, mostly that people weren't friendly. They weren't like, you know, there was no good mornings. There was no, it wasn't personable. You'd see people every day and they just continue with their regular school. And it's like, damn, like we're in the same class. And that would bother me. I shouldn't have let it bother me, but I'm like, damn, like, we're in the same class, we're in the same school, like, but everyone's just doing their own thing. Um, I. What about talking to people, being open? Like, uh, that was cool with me. Like, I was, I was pretty open with talking to people. Um, I gravitated towards the Islanders, Jamaicans, Panamanians, Haitians. You know, I'd have my Haitian flag hanging from my back pocket. Yeah, we all kind of had a way of. Short we were really right. repping Haiti a lot. Yeah, I mean, dude, it's it's a country you should be proud to come from. There's a lot of history and culture uh, in Haiti. I mean, yeah, it was something I was always proud to say. We used to go to the Compa Festival every year. 
Yeah. And we'd go see, you know, all the live bands play. And it was a way for us to feel a little bit at home, even though we weren't really mm -hmm. back in Haiti. Um, but yeah, but after, after coming here and like you, I had a, I had a hard time like finding friends. I didn't, I wasn't as open as I am like now today. I, I grew up to be a little bit more charismatic, but as I was young, I was very shy. Even when it started talking to girls, like it was hard for me to get a, Like when I got my first girlfriend, it was like, I was like two years here. Yeah. Know? Like I didn't get my first girlfriend until I was like 18 years old. I didn't lose <laughs> my virginity until I was 18 years old. I got a lot of stuff I did was a lot late and I felt like I kind of started late. Do you feel like it was the same for you? Did you did you have a high school girlfriend at the time? I don't remember you having a high school girlfriend, bro. I'm not going to lie. I had, um, yeah, little girlfriends here and there. Nothing serious. I wasn't sexually active in Haiti. Most of the girls in my class, school, like, I've known them so long, so I wasn't, like, trying to be on that level. Or my mind wasn't even there, really. You know, it was just playing basketball, soccer, and, you know, I wasn't that type of kid that was that much into that then. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, after I came here, my eyes are open. The girls were more open. <laughs> 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 they were more open. And it was a completely different thing, completely different. Um, it was cool, interesting. It was quite You remember experience. going to your first club? First club, wow. First club. Obviously, I had to pay the bouncers to get in because yeah. I wasn't 18 yet. So that's how I really got in the nightlife industry, just knowing all the bouncers, starting to find people to talk to to get in certain spots. Mm. And you, you did that you know. for a while. Didn't you promote? Oh, yeah. I was a promoter <laughs> for a while. But I wasn't like a street promoter, like, hey, getting girls in. I was more like upon demand, like, or just the fact that I knew people out, you know, scout who's trying to get in for a group with a group of people like hey you want to skip the line and get in and i make a quick <laughs> extra hundred bucks you know just to skip the line and say hey the year they're with me and you know started doing that for a while and then when when did you move to virginia was it after you got your bachelor's yeah like a couple like six months after i got my bachelor's i was just looking to get out of south florida because, you know, criminal justice, you could be an officer here, police, but there wasn't really what I wanted. You know, I wanted to work with government agencies and down here in South Florida. You have a lot of agencies, but to get my foot in the door and really indulge in that whole lifestyle, I was looking at D.C., Virginia. Um, my good friend Joe, um, Joe Philogen, <coughs> he lived in Virginia. He was like... Who was in a grade above us, by the way, in QCS. <laughs> yeah, we were on Joe the phone with him earlier today. It's yeah, funny. Joe was in the... <laughs> yeah, he invited... He, he, I have it. Sorry to cut you off here, but i got to <laughs> say this quick insert about Joe here. Um, when I left... When we left Haiti, we lost uh, contact with a lot of people mm -hmm. that we were friends with in Haiti. And this was, like, again, this was early 2000s, so there was, like... There was no Facebook at the time. Like, there was, there was not a way to contact people if, once you lost contact with. Yeah. He randomly hit me up. Through like, email? <laughs> no, no. This was, like, a few years ago, but this is this how long it's been since I've seen him. It mm. must have been, like, over a decade. And he hits me up just randomly one day. He's like, yo, man, you, you want to come to my wedding? I was yeah. like, for real? He's like, yeah, man. Like, I'm trying to get some friends, you know, like, from... I haven't seen in a while to come over. He contacted Mark Anthony. So I, I, I hooked up with Mark Anthony. I was like, yo, Mark Anthony, yo, dude, I already booked, like, the hotel and everything. Just buy your plane ticket, man. You can stay with me at the hotel room, and then I have a car and everything. So Mark Anthony and I ended up going to, I want to say, North Carolina. Not South Carolina, but I think it was North Carolina mm -hmm. where he got married. And it was just crazy to just, like, when, we, when you see somebody after you haven't seen them in so long, it literally felt like we're back at that playground at QCS. Yeah. Just fucking around, teasing one another. And it was just an, it's just amazing to have that kind of like brotherhood, like oh, camaraderie. Yeah. Like Most of my close like, friends yeah. are from Kiskeya. Yeah. And then years can go by and you don't feel like, you know, you lost, really lost contact with that person. The moment you start talking to that person, you just immediately pick back up like right where you left off. Yeah. So, yeah, we've known, we've known Joe for a long time. So, sorry. Go ahead back to your thing you met, met up with Joe back in Virginia and yeah um you know met up with him and um he really I stayed at his house for actually like 
like a month or two. I went up there, went for the academy. Um, I started the academy for what? Diplomatic security mm. with the State Department, and I I went up there, did training. I was on freaking cereal, bananas, and like PB and J for a month because I saved all up my little change and went up there and did training there. Airbnbs and hotel rooms, and then I got on my feet, and then after that it was just up so from what there. So what was your first job? Like after you did your, your training, you did your diplomatic security test, you did all that, what did you do as your first gig? Like what, what got you on your feet? What got you out of Joe's, Joe's house I mean, and stuff like that? I mean, because training is minimum wage until oh, so they you paid get, you even though you were training? Yeah, it was minimum wage training, but until, you know, you pass everything, you get the actual rate. And from there, you know, I was working at the State Department and, you know, Standing post for 12 hours, rain, snow. It was very interesting. But you know. where, where, where are you working? Like, post where? where At the State Department in D.C. On like C Capitol Street. Hill or something? No, like. Capitol Hill is the U.S. Capitol. The United States Department Because I've only been there one time, so I'm trying to picture, like, where you could have been working. Um, but yeah. Where the Secretary of State's office is. Gotcha. So that's, at the time, you know, it was Mike Pompeo. That was the Secretary of State. Mm-hmm. And um, Trump was president. So, you know, there would be, it was pretty interesting. A lot of, um, a lot of action, news. You would be really um, in tune with what's going on. People that would be coming, diplomats, um, you know, high profile, high profile individuals. And you were like in the middle of the sauce. And I was like, wow, like being in South Florida, you know, working at the hospital as a mental health tech for over that five came, years. That came after? No, that's what I was doing before I moved up there, you know. Oh, so before you were the diplomat security, you were in the mental health? Uh, I was in behavioral health. That was okay. specifically what I worked on most of my years. Here was in Florida? Mostly, yeah. Okay. Mental health, behavioral health, that field, juveniles, um, all types of disorders. And, you know, I was... I moved up there and just being up there opened my eyes, um, got a clearance, um, high clearance, and it was interesting, you know, the people you'd see, you know, just brushing shoulders with them. But how was it when you were a uh, behavior, uh, <sighs> what was the proper term? What um, was it? The title was a mental health tech, okay. mental health technician. My first job as a mental health technician was um, working at a juvenile facility mm -hmm. in Pembroke Pines, where you know it would be. Did you have interactions with any of the with the juveniles that were in of there? Of course, like? you know it's a one. Sometimes you'd have a one-to-one -one observation, or you would be assigned a certain group of and teens. You just, and you just watch them. And you watch them, you observe them, you de-escalate a lot of de-escalation, um, breaking up fights. Um, but you know you have a sheet where you document their behavior. Mm. They have it's they'll they'll be were there for on, a amount of time. Were you on meds? Did you guys give them medication and stuff like that? Also? I wouldn't oh, no. prescribe medication, but they had nurses on site, um, psychiatrists on site. They would go to school. They would actually live there for an amount of time because they wouldn't. Oh, so go it's to like a rehab. Uh, I wouldn't Not say really. it's a rehab. It was you know some of them would be troubled or they would go through the foster care program or just a um just the system. And instead of a sentence, sometimes they would need rehabilitation. Yeah, rehab, I guess. And just, you know, meet great kids there, individuals, where there would be a lot of different cases. And, you know, it was pretty interesting. It really opened up my... Um, I was going to ask you that next. Um, how did it, like, make you like see things <sighs> perspective-wise? Like, you're seeing all these troubled minds and... I'm sure it kind of helped you understand, like, kind of how, how some people just take, like, some things for granted, and like, I mean, like, their freedom of will yeah. or stuff like that. Like, it just like having a mental illness can be very hard, and yeah. you know, you can't you can't lead a normal life, and it can be very mm -hmm. difficult. So I'm I'm wondering, like, how did that um, affect you, and how did it progress you to become maybe a more open thinker or more. Mm. Um, more accepting of right. people's disabilities or something. Well, I've been a mental health advocate for a while because I, d I worked for the YMCA also, 
and I was a special needs um, counselor. So I would work with um, children with autism, um, Down syndrome, different um, disorders where you would have, a, you'd need a lot of patience to deal with them. And just from there, my stress level, my patience, um, nonverbal cues, I would have to be really vigilant of looking at things coming ahead of time and just being able to find something to have to relate with to someone, you know? Because mm. if I'm working with someone every day, five days a week, you're going to eventually find something to relate to them with, you know? Sure. Something that would make you be able to find what gets them to act out. So this is what I'm going to do to prevent this. So I'll be doing a lot of preventative work you know, because I don't want to wait for them to act out, so I'm going to try to prevent it. Gotcha. So okay. If it's an individual, I want to have them not being around or, you know, loud music or not moving this toy here. So being with these children kind of boosted me up before working with teens with troubles, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. So that was pretty. And then from and there, and working then what, in the hospital. What, what made you transition from that to become a diplomatic security and moving to DC um, and stuff like that? Was I, it just opportunity? You wanted to change up the field? Or well, I had a degree in criminal justice and I wanted to work in the some form of government agency. So I really looked at that as an opportunity. Of course, the pay was very um, tempting and wanted, I made me really want to jump on it, but the opportunity of just leaving South Florida and moving to dc and i've never lived there before and being independent too. you know so i i like the um work i people would always ask me if i was in the military i was never in the military but um i was i had some structure i always had this form of structure and i was pretty rigid and i was really in i was really into that before i moved there i'll try I, I applied to be an officer several agencies um I didn't get those positions, but something better came. Mm. So how long did you do diplomatic security for in Virginia before you decided to come back to Florida? Um, about two years. Mm. About two years. Um, I dealt in the snow, first time really working in snow, waking up in the morning, scraping your, scraping your window, your glass, and then the first time I did it, like I'm like, damn, this glass is on my windshield, and I put the windshield wiper on, wiper on, and just ice just froze the whole thing. Oh, you talking about that when you hit the the, the water? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> yeah, that I, didn't, I learned the hard way, but yeah, um, I moved back down here on December 31st. I put my car on a train. Went down to f Orlando and drove the west of rest of the way. Mm, and this was what year? 2020? 2021. 2021? Yeah. Mm. Hold on. No, it had to be 2020. 2020 sorry. Yeah, 2020. Because it was right after I got back. I'm, I okay. moved down here and then January 6th happened. So yes. it was 2021. What was, when was the Capitals? Yeah, yeah. When did they right. go through? 2021, right? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. right. Yeah. So I moved right before that and things really changed after that, you know. All right, let me let me backtrack back to Virginia and um, tell me about the inception of No Love in the Paint and where that idea came from and what inspired that. <sighs> no Love in the Paint. That started in 2015. 2015, and I always loved art. I always loved um, working with artists. I myself would always make music, but for fun. I don't have music out there. I don't have a mixtape out there, but I would create it. I have a lot of friends that are in the industry, so I'd always um, be part of that. And when it comes to basketball, which No Love in the Paint, it's a metaphor for the game of basketball, and that's where everything happens in the paint for me, you know? And in life, that's where everything happens for real. Like, the judgment, the knit and grit, the blood, that's where people are tough with you, they're rough with you, mm -hmm. and that's all part of the game. Mm -hmm. So, um, I would work with a lot with my, pff, your brother, little brother. Sure, yeah, Stefan. <laughs> Stefan. Got and the, all the graphic skills. You know, but, you know, he painted a lot. We, we worked a lot together, and I'm like, yo, let's make, 
some shirts. Let's make some shirts. And, I mean, you guys used to write you know? freestyles too. Oh my god, I have really so like much stuff, freestyles yeah. with him. I think that's someone I have the most freestyles ever recorded yeah. with. We've had a lot of great sessions, yeah. like getting high and writing man. down things, yeah. rapping. I mean, this was this was like ten years ago though. So oh man, it was a it was a it was quite a quite a the twenties were wild. He said the twenties, nineteen twenties. No, our <laughs> age, the twenties. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm that old. I mean, yeah, we're going mid thirties now, so I mean, we've no, that would put us what? We've known each other for. That's funny. Today is the twentieth. Today is yeah. the twentieth, August twentieth. Yeah, today's my godson's birthday. Mm. Yeah. Happy yeah. birthday, godson. What's his name? Mateo. Mm. Yeah, I think he's turning. I want to say five. Okay. Four or five. Mm. It's been a while since I've seen him because I left Haiti two years ago, so. He was born over there and you know like i met the father there like i i knew the father like probably i met him when he got married like because of my wife i met him and i was like honestly when he called me to tell me he wanted me to be the godfather for his kid and i was like i've known this guy like two years <laughs> and i'm like bro you sure want me to be Godfather? like i'm honored you know you're giving me the responsibility because i think that's like outside of like Picking somebody as your best man for a wedding, mm -hmm. giving somebody the responsibility of being godfather to your child is yeah. like super important. Like, I mean, it's call me traditional, but I take that to the heart. Of course, you know, like I feel like I'm responsible for this kid at yeah. one point or whatever. You know, like I always feel like if if I'm the if I have the godfather role that I want the godson to always look at me as like that that uncle that you can always come to and talk to and be open-minded with, you know, no bias, you know, type of stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, I always felt like that was one of the things. It, it, it was, it's like, that's why, the, that's why I, I feel like, like a brother, like if you if you have brothers and, you know, some people pick their brother to be their best man or their brother to be the godfather of the kid, which is fine, you know, people can choose their siblings. But I'm like, if your brother is already going to be the uncle, to your son, why make them godfather? I feel like that's something you should reserve for people that you feel like are very important in your life, and you let them know this is how, this is how important you are, hmm. this is how important you've been in my life. So I'm gonna grant you, you know, godfather to my kid. Like yeah. for, I feel like that's just a well, great way of saying thank you to a friend for always being there and and showing them that you actually trust them to even be like, yo, if anything happens to me. You know, my, my son is in your hands, and I know he's going to be in comfortable hands. So I always took that to heart and stuff like that. So it's his birthday today. Happy birthday to Mateo. Mm. Happy and birthday, Mateo. So let, let's go back to uh, No Love in the Paint. And when did it become, like, start to become, like, not only a blog, but start to sell merchandise? Because mm. you, you sell shirts and, and hats, and it's, it's an active yeah. website. You can go and purchase stuff like that on there so when when did you decide to make it into a brand where you actually wanted to start wearing it and make it into like a, a movement or or since yeah. day one actually because after we made the shirts we were not really focused on people buying it we were just rocking it mm. you know just from that early stage we were rocking it but i had the logo you know i had the website interviewed several artists but like you asked me having the actual website was when i would just have people that would ask me hey what is this mm -hmm. when people are curious about something i'm really fond about it kind of pushes me more to make it tangible mm -hmm. and i really wanted to focus on having something tangible and i was focused more on art being on these shirts but then i was looking at merchandise and pushing the merchandise to support everything else I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know? So I would say that same year, cause it was more like, okay, I decided to do that and found a way to make the website, made designs and I just connected it, made the store, but I was always into websites, creating websites, blogs, buying domains. Yeah, buying domains have so much domains and so no love in the paint. It's only a website. There's no pop up store. There's no somewhere can you can buy physical physical clothes. Um, my cousin actually, 
He's a designer in Atlanta, Lee Cherry, and um, he has certain clothing, and we collab together. That's the only physical place that I have clothes in, and that's in Atlanta. So I don't have anything else in other stores. I'm working on having an art gallery, so that would be the only other place I'll have it. And everything's online right now, so um, I'm not into fashion design. I'm more on the merch end, hoodies, um, certain designs, so I don't want people to think I'm like some fashion designer. I have the taste, however, I'm not tapping into that because that's a whole other world that um, I'm not getting into that competition in that area. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk about something that is close to both of us, that kind of hits home. We're gonna, let's talk about Haiti. Mm. Let's talk about free Haiti. Let's talk about what Haiti means to you and why is it that no matter how far you get from Haiti, you just can't get it away from you. <laughs> like it's just, it's in your roots. There's a gravitational pull. Yeah. Being raised there. Yeah. That's what made me. You know I used to say like I, you know, it's like I, I literally had raps where I was like, when my mom died, it was Haiti that raised me. Mm. And I would always, you know. Speaking of your, of your mom passing, your first tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> is your mom's name on your chest. Yeah. Yep. It's funny. That, I feel like that wasn't a tough decision for you to make. Venus. Well, it's the first tattoo, so. And it's on your chest. On my chest, so it's pain. And I was not, I didn't mind having that pain. And you're not, you, know, you weren't the size you are today where you would your chest and you are now, you know, it was Mr. Bird chest. Yeah, you flat chested. The guy was, <laughs> guy was all over Damn. me just like, you know, but with that same tattoo, I had the cross yep. also that same time. So in my head, the only pain I could compare that to was the earthquake in Haiti. And that was actually what I kept in my mind while I was getting that tattoo. And of course, you know, I was listening to the Nas Illmatic album I gave to the tattoo artist that, mm -hmm. you know, that gave, that gave me that tattoo. Album. So I tried to have a connection with everyone that I let them work on me. So what, what, what's, what's Free Haiti? Free Haiti. Free Haiti. Free Haiti dot org website comes out January 1st, 2023. Um, it's an active 501c3 nonprofit that I started. Thought of the name actually after I didn't thought of the name. It just, I just caught it, you know, after almost two years ago, there was a massacre in this um, village in Haiti where a lot of officers were killed and it was on, it was broadcasted on live on, on WhatsApp, you know, how videos are shared of all these things. Man, that and WhatsApp, bro. Yeah. So there was a movement of free Haiti of the violence going on and the corruption, but it was like very, it went on for a small amount of time, you know, but I was always for this, but then I looked at it, I'm like, damn, is this going to be another hashtag where people just see it, they feel it, hashtag it, post it, and then done, back to the regular routine. Right. And I saw this, and I'm like, okay, Free Haiti, damn. Freehaiti.org. Freehaiti.com was taken. So I'm not into business of profiting, but Freehaiti.org was available, and I was like, damn, I'm going to make something out of this. And I wanted to really work on finding a way to promote legit nonprofits, projects, and force innovation and transparency. And I wanted to focus on the just transparency. Yeah, it's very important to have transparency. Because outside. there's about, f in South Florida alone, there's about 5,000 nonprofits. If we have all these nonprofits, how come Haiti's in the same state? I mean, Haiti has a bunch of nonprofits also. And it's but a like nonprofit said, haven. They're not transparent. So you don't know where the money's going. And don't get me wrong, there's great nonprofits. There's great no, projects sure, yeah. that are happening. For sure. But on the grand scheme of things, a lot of it is not being <laughs> obviously look at the earthquake that happened. That's not the, of that's just one that. of the main yeah. that's one of the main issues that happened that where everyone's looking at them. We got all this something. money that yeah. happened with the earthquake and even till today you think about it, if there's an earthquake right now, do we have the resources? Are we ready or we're going to wait for another kumbaya fucking let's heal the world, we are the world moment. 
pour money in and the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, because you put the money in and we don't know where it goes. We don't know how it's being distributed. Like you, you think you're putting your money towards a good cause. And like you said, when the earthquake happened in, in 2010, it had so many people wanted to help out and contribute. Which is a great thing. And, which is, uh, yeah, it's great. But with every great thing, there's also people trying to take advantage. Yeah. So um, I wanted to focus on key sectors sustainable energy, health, security, education, agriculture, technology, engineering, trade, social services, and not only focus on Port-au-Prince, because when you think of Haiti and all the news, it's mostly things that are coming out of Port-au-Prince. Right, it's the central Which hope. is the capital. Yeah. And everything is there, and things that happen there, they say, oh, this is Haiti. This is yeah. Haiti's That's bad. a huge problem. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm breaking it up, and all the regions, breaking it up and just exposing all the sectors and everyone has something they could bring to the table. You're gonna see what you're interested in. What are, your, what are you knowledgeable in? Where are you from? Where do you wanna contribute to? And there's gonna be a way that you can contribute and you're also not gonna lose hope in this helping system. You're not going to be losing hope with helping and not knowing where your money goes or where your aid goes. You're going to be able to keep track of things. And I'm not just another nonprofit. I want to promote current nonprofits. Sure, 100%. So there's going to be a vetting system. There's going to be a way that you could see here's other projects that are going on, whether it's in education, art schools, anything. Mm -hmm. And we're not just focusing on Port-au-Prince again. We're going all over. And I, I think it's very important to not focus on just Port-au-Prince because, again, I'm going to go back to the earthquake. After the earthquake oversaturated. Happened, yeah, exactly. It got way too oversaturated, overpopulated, because after the earthquake, a lot of NGOs and nonprofits came in, there, and they came in for good things. They offered a lot of jobs, but a lot of the Haitians moved from the outside cities. They moved into the Port-au-Prince, and they just never left. And Port-au-Prince wasn't really made to be to have all these millions of people couldn't so, support it exactly so you have like all these beautiful cities on the outskirts of haiti like okai hench okap gonaive lagunav all these places mm -hmm. that are out of reach now because nobody wants to go to them everybody is stuck in being central in haiti and these con these parts of the country are not being developed um, the uh, resources are being less, there's less infrastructure, there's less like support for the people that are over there. And it's so separated from Port-au-Prince that when you speak to a Haitian that's in those parts of the country, they don't sound or even have the same views as the people in Port-au-Prince. Completely the, different. The, the news doesn't even travel the same way, you know? Port-au-Prince had beco has become a hub of a lot of corruption. And um, this corruption, it bleeds into everything. And how mm -hmm. are you going to protect Free Haiti from falling into the same pit as all these other NGOs that are, are there to try to do, but somehow without having the transparency that you, you're willing to give? Good question. To, to, to go forward and not be able to get stuck into the same rut where you're just one of those other nonprofits mm -hmm. you're just like not really doing anything for the country because there are some that are like that yeah but there are some that are actually doing really well so I, i'm not knocking out all of them i'm just saying like there's definitely a handful and quite a few not ngos oh, yeah. that are just there for the wrong things you know it's it's it is what it is you know even individuals alone without a name without a ngo but to find out how is having patience and focusing on the blueprint. If you stick to the blueprint and you have a system that you really focus on the foundation of something and you're not in a rush, you want to really work on making something work, you have to find people to work with. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything alone. Of course. you, you got to find a team. What's team on the flag? L'Union fell off us. I have to find, and everyone on the team, we have to find people that have like minds. Mm -hmm. We're not... We, we are not looking at the now. We're looking in the long term of things. I'm not looking at seeing Haiti get better while I'm alive. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, there will be progress. There will be progress. Our grandkids. Yes. However, you have to have a foundation, and they will know that. And you have to add innovation. I have someone I'm talking to from the Netherlands, and, you know, I met him through <laughs> TED Talk. 
and we're working on a blockchain. You know, I have free free Haiti crypto, and we're working on a blockchain. And through this blockchain, there's a lot of transparency already, yes. and we're using technology to help this. We're yes. not just applying the same old steps. We're applying innovation. You know, mm -hmm. I could have a billion dollars right now, and that's not the only thing that's going to change a place. Yeah. You know, you money, have to have throwing money at a problem doesn't fix it. Obviously, yeah, because <laughs> you know? Haiti would have been fixed already. Yeah. The amount of money that's been poured into into all kinds of programs in Haiti. Yeah. Just and and the thing is, I'm not. We're not trying to fix Haiti. It's something that you have to see what can, you could work on. Everyone has their role they could play. Mm -hmm. Everyone has their role they could play. You know, and you know, there's people that are gonna say that. Oh, you know, this is dangerous. You know, people get killed. You know, people get killed over these things. You're gonna fight the system and all that. But me, I already have a mentality of this is already a war for me. I I have a lot of heart for this. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's a really long game for me, and I have enough people, friends, associates that I could find ways to make it happen. So what's next for Free Haiti? What what goes from here up until January until the website launches? What what what's 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 on the the pavement like? Where, the pavement where right now is just working on certain prototype projects to put out to see how we could test run certain things. Is there is there a demographic you're leaning towards to attack first? Are you going straight to the education sector or are you trying to go um, to the micro business sector? It's going to be simultaneous because we're not f seeing a specific sector. We're working on the system right now. Mm. We're not looking at what sector we're going to be getting at. We're looking at what system's going to work for this. You know, we're mm -hmm. not looking at, we already know the problems. Mm -hmm. We already know the problems. We already have the demographics we're looking at the system to make this stay to make it maintainable mm. we're not trying to just have a bank account and right. funds and these things we need a blueprint we need a we need transparency we need something that where you could see everything that's going on mm -hmm. so you can, so people can feel comfortable like knowing that whatever they donate is going for a good cause and of course the website and the thing is i don't want to focus on the donation aspect because we're going to be working with businesses as well. Yeah. It's okay. going to be projects as with businesses as well. We're not looking at, we have to have an economy that's growing as well. We have to have the people involved. There's going, like, if you build a hospital here, you have to have some, you have to have things in the area. If the people are working there, what are they going to do? They're going to work here and then just go back to something? Yeah, there needs to be a whole there infrastructure, has to be some, hospitals, There has housing. to be, there, there's systems that we are working on to, apply this new innovation to this you know this is the main focus of it is innovation responsibility accountability inclusion sustainability these are the things we're really looking at these are the things we're attacking we're, we're looking to go against the grain and not stick to the same old thing what, what inspired you to do this like what, why, why 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 do this why why start something that you know i mean like like we said before there's so many ngos out there trying to help haiti and i guess free haiti from what they're mm -hmm. at but what makes it well what, what decided you to make you want to i always it? liked promoting people i always promoted people with no living in paint i pr i would promote artists mm -hmm. and if i have a heart for haiti why not promote great projects yeah there's Absolutely. certain people that have projects that they're doing things without promotion. Yeah. You have this lady that lives in this area and she makes her own sandals for women in prisons. You don't know her name. She doesn't have a crazy Instagram page and she's helping these women in this prison and she's changing these lives for women. Mm -hmm. She's going through lots of loopholes because the system there in the prison, there's no form of organization so she's going through loopholes to get approvals and she's helping women in the prison mm. and that's just one little difference that she's making in people's lives to 30 women and they sing they you know they so do things what's going to be on the website when it launches it's going to be basically like a yellow pages of opportunities of how you could help so with the map like set out in different regions. Okay. You so click the region and you see the sector of how you could help, you know? 
You see different sectors of where you could click on. You see different projects. Like what's happening in those different sectors, what projects are going to be funded and stuff yes, like that? There will be a page where it's sort of like a news feed blog of things that are educational, informative, mm -hmm. of course. But the main focus is different projects that are happening. You're going to have projects that are being promoted. And the thing that it is, you know, the name could be controversial because people could say, who's free Haiti? What is free Haiti? Um, free, is Haiti Haiti captive under something? Is Haiti, um, uh, when were they people, free? There's a lot of pride. Like, yeah, people could be like, Haiti's technically already free. They you got know? their freedom independent. But is Haiti really free? Are the Haitian people actually free? Because um, I don't think they are. What makes someone free? The state of mind, I guess. There you go. It could be a state of mind. It could be all that. But do you feel that the majority of the people in Haiti are free? Absolutely not. I don't think anybody, in, in terms of the people, if we're talking about the people of Haiti, the Haitians, the people that are living under the dollar days, the two dollar day people. Two dollars. These yeah. people. Less than that. Some yeah. of the most resilient people on the of planet. Of course, based and, on the history. Yeah. And they are not free. And it's something that needs to be recognized. They are being robbed of a lot of things. And we're not just talking finances here. We're talking about a way of life. Opportunity. Opportunities. Education. Just becoming a better person, human being. Like... Haitians are not only resilient, but they're extremely humble people. They're very religious people. They want good for people. And I can't understand why somebody would see something like this and be like, yeah, I'm just going to take this as an opportunity to take advantage of these people. Because people are opportunists and there's a lot of greed. And when you look at someone and you judge, oh, yeah, they're going to, the Haitian politicians are thieves. They give money and they just steal it. Um, a lot of these people are in misery. A lot of them are exploited. A lot of them have, <laughs> they're put in positions by people who are calling the shots. Right. You know, so and it's vote, easy to point the finger. Your, your you votes really don't count in Haiti when it comes down to it. When, when there's elections in Haiti, it's hard to say that like, yay, my vote's going towards a change. It doesn't seem that way when it seems like the richest, the guy with the most money is the one that wins. And that's the thing. Free Haiti is about not just the international community helping or diasporas helping, but it's a whole movement with the people of Haiti. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The people of Haiti, not just the people having businesses and, you know, they're giving people jobs, but it's the way of uplifting someone. You know, I have great friends who have business owners, and mm -hmm. they actually teach someone, like, working to be able to get their position absolutely to get a raise and be able to get this not the mentality of boss and yeah. you're always looking at someone looking up to them and this we're done with that shit yeah we're in a new age when when i was living in haiti um a couple years ago before i moved here two years ago i was living in haiti and um i was working with the family business and stuff like that and obviously you have employees and managers and stuff like that and, and you have to train these people and sometimes they have no experience or background in mm -hmm. what is it that they're doing. So you have to train them to do it. Definitely. And um, it's hard. Something I noticed within the Haitian people is that they don't like, they don't understand how to push another person forward. They like to see each other as equal. The moment you name someone is, okay, you're the manager of this sector, for some reason, they automatically look at this person as this person is working for the white man. Like this mm. person's against us. When mm -hmm. I tried to make sure that when I was working in that environment and I had my, my staff, I made sure to make them understand that we're all equal here, mm -hmm. even with me. I may be the business owner, but I work with you guys. I'm here every morning. Yeah. I work till night to close. You should be able to come talk to me about anything. Mm -hmm. Our colors shouldn't separate us, yeah. but it does. I'm not going to lie. It does. I mean, you the, know, it the makes history, you a target. Look at the history. You know? It is. Haiti's history is very troubled. Of so course. It's, and it's very, di it's very like, it's very diluted. That's how I look at it. When I look at it to, based on my work I've done, I've worked with a lot of troubled individuals. And if you compare it, Haiti's a troubled child who went through, didn't even go through the foster system. There's no foster care system. You're still in the streets. You're a baby that grew up seeing trauma all the time. Is that why you changed your Instagram name to Baby from Haiti? <laughs> I got that <laughs> nickname in D.C. For I real? got that nickname in D.C. 
because I was this officer called me baby from Haiti and after he said that I'm like yo I'm gonna make that my Instagram name <laughs> and if I become a rapper my name will be baby <laughs> from Haiti I'm not gonna lie when I first saw the post baby from Haiti I'm like is that Jack <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> but hey, you know, you've always had your little funky Instagram names. I love Haiti, bro. I've been to Haiti like four times this year already. And people get mad at me, relatives. It's like, like you could fucking die here. I, I don't think the, it's people should get mad of you doing something, especially when you have... It's not mad. It's more of a care. I see thing, what you like, mean. Because they know what it's like over there. You know, like people that, course, that are, are afraid of you going over there. Is people that are concerned of the way things are over there. They, it hasn't really progressed to the good side. The, the president got assassinated last year, and there's still no president. Mm. You know, they still haven't done the elections. We don't know what's happening with that stuff. It's it's a free for all. Yeah. So, it is. so, so how 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 are we supposed to progress when we can't even make up our minds who we're gonna decide to run the country, and the person that's gonna run the country is is somebody that is even like can even fit the bill like to do the job like yeah. you can't just put anybody as I'm not power. Even, like I'm not even looking at the president I'm not we don't even have a president right now so I'm I'm not even looking at that I'm looking at the people I'm looking at people like forget a president how are you going to put food on the table at your home we want roads we want this and that but someone doesn't even have a system of sanitation you know mm -hmm. you don't even have sanitation you don't even have a toilet in your home and i'm looking at these bigger things yeah i think they should i think the focus of haiti should definitely be like a whole reform they just need to yeah that's why that's why there's different sectors that's yeah. why there's different sectors what, and you exactly. could put you could put your interests into what you can do and what you want to do you know, because mm -hmm. everyone has an answer. Everyone has a, this is how you fix Haiti. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been through this conversation so many times, you know, but there's so many ways you could help. Is that a fan about that? Sorry about that. There was uh, somebody exiting the building. Forgot to close the door. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, so we, so Free Haiti is gonna help uh, help divide the sectors and be able to make sure that each branch gets their own focus. Their own, the, the, each district gets their own focus: education, infrastructure, sanitation, all that stuff. And it could be done at the same time. And there's, that's the thing. It could be done at the same time. And there's people that have great things already that need exposure. Right. You have great organizations that are there already. that are doing such a great job, you know. And, and they just need to get recognized. Being recognized. Being Free exposed. Haiti can help them do that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to promote the great projects that are already here and help by putting certain minds to bring innovation to these things. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's such things happening already that we're focusing so much on the bad. And it's right. like we need a break to focus on the good, too. Right. Because there's great work being done. Right. And Haiti is a beautiful island. Let's not get it twisted. Like Haiti is probably one of the more beautiful islands in, in, in the Caribbean. That, well, I can't say that for all the Caribbean, but from what I visited, like Haiti is definitely up there and some of the most has some of those beautiful sceneries. I mean, it's called IET for a reason. It's the land of the mountains. Mm -hmm. That's what the indigenous people called it. And it, it, it literally is that. When you're, when you're hiking the mountains of Haiti, it's endless. It's a sea of endless mountains. And it's absolutely stunning. And the beaches are absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Not filled with life because there's a lot of overfishing, you know, like when it comes to countries like that where there's a lot of starvation and there's no regulation on fishing and winter fish and letting them, you know, repopulate and all these things. There, the coral reef life has suffered over there. Um, when I used to snorkel over there and, and do my free diving stuff, um, I do, did notice like every time I would go visit my snorkeling spot, there would be less and less mm. life out there. So 
Yeah, definitely regulations. And I feel like, you know, it needs structure. Right, it's, yeah. it's, it's all, you know? yeah, it's just structure, really. It's just finding the right structure and sticking to it and knowing where the money goes and, and how it's being spent. And if, and if Free Haiti is that, then I'm all for it because so many times I've seen many great ideas come and go and they don't even leave a mark. And don't get me wrong. I'm not naive to this whole Haiti situation of fixing a problem when it's so deep. I'm looking at this from a war perspective as well. I'm not looking at this from a, hey, kumbaya, let's just sit in this tap tap with missionaries and just pull up, you know. I'm looking at this from a whole different point of view. And this is the first time I'm really vocal about it, you know. But, yeah, that's all I could say. So, freehaiti.org launches next year. Yes. And um, However, you could. I have the Instagram page yeah, open. Yeah, I was going to ask about Freehaiti.org, F-R-E-E-H-E-I-T-I-O-R-G. Um, you know, my Instagram, Baby from Haiti. And, you know, most of the people I'm working with are within my circle. So, I'm, I'm not really on an open door policy right now. But... You, I am reachable based on inquiries and, you know, just from there. Mm. Okay. All right. Well, appreciate the conversation, Jack. And, uh, you know, we do have plans to go have some pizza after this. So we're going to let everybody <laughs> Where are we going, go by here. the way? Where are we having we're pizza? We're going to go to Coley's Pizza on Pembroke Pines. It's a fire pizza spot in the area. So we're definitely going to enjoy the slice. And, Good thing uh, this isn't live right now because I don't want people just pulling up. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Fucking MLK out here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Oliver Stone Podcast. Safe journeys across the stars.